Well, thank you. It's so good to be here with you. Um, I want to uh, thank AWC for putting this on. It's, uh, it's I can imagine, both uh, an, an educational experience. And who doesn't love hearing from politicians? What a wonderful way to start your morning. Um, but no, seriously, there are so many leaders in the room here today from all over the state. And so it's a good opportunity for uh, us to get to introduce ourselves uh, to you all. Let me tell you a bit about my background. Um, as you heard, my parents were immigrants to this country. They came here from Iran in the 70s. And uh, they came here in search of economic and educational opportunities. Uh, my dad came to study at the University of Washington. My mom came to study at the University of Maryland. So as you can see, from very early on, um, our family's story uh, was really inscribed within the story of public higher education, public universities in this country. I was born in Baltimore, and shortly after I was born, I was diagnosed with a rare childhood cancer that took my eyesight in my left eye as a newborn and then came back again and took my eyesight in my right eye, uh, leaving me completely blind at age eight. And I, and I often joke that you know that happened in 1989. That's when I was eight years old. So all eight years I could see took place in the 1980s. So all my visual memories are from the 1980s. So everyone still looks like Cyndi Lauper and Boy George. It's extremely odd. Uh, but you know, uh, after that happened, my dad uh, decided that you know, we wanted to move back to where he'd gone to college. He wanted to move back to the Pacific Northwest. And uh, we asked around, my parents asked around, you know, what is a city, um, where is a community where um, our son who has this special need, this uh, set of obstacles, but who ought to be able to live up to his full potential, where is a good place? And they did what any parents would do, which is they looked for a place that had good public schools, safe streets and neighborhoods, good parks for recreation, um, and good places for my parents to find work. And uh, even in Baltimore, the name Bellevue, Washington was, was well known back then for all of those things. So that's where my parents settled. They came to Bellevue. Um, and that you know, shows you the importance of uh, a city. First of all, the interconnectedness of cities and our public school system, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, but also uh, how a city can be branded and develop an identity that can uh, have national and even international uh, implications and can be a magnet to people uh, who themselves will come and contribute um, in important ways. I often say that you know, the easiest thing for me to do would be to stand up here, I mean, you heard that bio, um, and to say, you know, yeah, it's true, I, I did do all these things. I was a Rhodes Scholar and I did go to Yale and I did all these things and you know what, I did it all on my own. You know, it'd be the easiest thing. I could just say I worked really hard, pulled myself up by my bootstraps, and if I could do it as a three-time cancer-surviving blind Iranian-American from a mixed-religion immigrant family, <laughs> then so should you and so should everyone else, right? The only problem with that is as good as it would feel, I know it's not true. I know that it was because of really well-funded public schools and great teachers. It was because of state services that taught me how to use a cane and read Braille, and listen to audiobooks, and take uh, King County Metro. It was because of all those public services that I was able to go, as I like to say, from Braille to Yale. And that's what got me interested in, in giving back, because you know what you learn growing up as a blind kid is you learn the importance of inclusion. I had to fight and advocate for my own inclusion on the playground, in the classroom, and ultimately in the workplace. And as I did that, I realized how many others were being excluded from the ability to fulfill their dreams. So I realized, look, if for me the key to inclusion was really critical investments in this type of public human and physical infrastructure, then I can give back to others and let other people experience inclusion in this great country as well. It's why I went to law school, it's why I became a legislator, and now it's why I'm running for lieutenant governor, a position which I called the state's chief inclusion officer. Why do I call it that? Because the lieutenant governor, yes, presides over the state senate. And so, you know, if you're looking for someone who uh, practiced in this area of law, teaches legislation at a law school, uh, has experience in both legislative chambers, 
then I've, you know, I've got a candidate in mind for you. But I actually think presiding over the state Senate is a lot more important than that. Because the, the president of the Senate is a member of the legislative body, but unlike every other legislator, all the other 147 legislators, they each represent a district. But the president of the Senate is elected statewide, and so should have a focus on inclusion to make sure that those voices who may not, as many cities do, not fit neatly within one district, or may be a minority voice within a particular legislative district, that all of those voices are heard. It's what I consider an at-large member of the legislative branch. So that's one critical aspect in which a lieutenant governor is the chief inclusion officer. The second thing, though, is the lieutenant governor, as I think I heard Mr. McClendon mention, uh, does have a key economic development role to play. And this is where I'm really excited about working with all of you and your cities. Because the lieutenant governor chairs and makes appointments to the Joint Legislative Committee on Economic Development and International Relations. And by statute and, and increasingly by convention is our state's uh, diplomatic and global affairs uh, and international relations officer. So for me, the critical pieces of economic development, the three uh, buckets, uh, if you will, are one, investment in our human capital, two, investment in our infrastructure, and you guys obviously are critical partners in both of those. And then third, where I really need to learn from you all, is around the work of marketing and promoting our state. And I mentioned Bellevue and my parents knowing about it from, from Baltimore because cities are really how uh, we are branded. Uh, when it comes to promoting foreign direct investment, when it comes to promoting tourism, when it comes to promoting trade, when it comes to marketing our state, Here's the thing about Washington, and for those of you who've traveled on chamber trips or delegations or city study missions, you'll know what I'm talking about. You know, when you go overseas, when, when you say you're from Washington State, what do people think? They think about Washington, we've got a branding problem with our state, right? There's, a, there's, there's another Washington that gets more headlines, and it's always going to be that way. So, pe but people know Seattle. Around the country, people know Spokane, Tacoma, Bellevue. Uh, Vancouver's got its own little bit of a branding challenge, but I like America's Vancouver. I think there's a, there's a way we, we, we do that. So here's the point is that our cities are where an overwhelming majority of Washingtonians live. It's where business takes place. It's where tourists come to visit. It's where when people want to make foreign direct investment, whether it's from other states or from other countries, they're thinking about what city they're investing in. So I need your help to try to figure out where the Office of Lieutenant Governor should focus. I've got some ideas of my own, but you all are the ones that are closest to the businesses, to the workers, to the institutions of higher education. And so it's so important that we work together to think about how do we promote Kirkland? How do we promote University Place? How do we promote Everett? Um, because each one of these has amazing contributions. I mean, our state's economy is incredibly diverse, from the defense sector to agriculture, from life sciences to aerospace, from software to retail. We're on the front lines of so many areas, and, and different cities are leading on different things. Right now, Spokane, for example, because of WSU Spokane and the medical school we're building there, is all set to become a hub of innovation, particularly in the life sciences. So that's an area I want to partner with you on. It's been such a pleasure working with you all, and AWC does a great job of representing nearly 300 jurisdictions, and trust me, you don't all agree all of the time, but AWC manages to keep you all under one roof and have a united voice, a unified voice in Olympia, so we've worked together. I've been a champion for uh, restoring liquor revenue to cities. I've been a champion and pushed hard for pushing for um, marijuana revenue, because we know that the negative externalities of that new policy are being borne by cities um, and also by counties. Um, I've objected vehemently in the House and the Senate to sweeps of the Public Works Assistance Program. Uh, when it comes to tourism, we know clearly there's a, um, we need to build on lodging tax revenue with new sources of revenue. 
But as we do these things, as you guys know, it is really politically difficult for legislators who have stakeholders and special interests to deal with. It is very hard for cities and counties to have your voices heard. And then often, your best ambassadors are the members of the city council, are the mayors, the elected officials um, who are partners to legislators, both politically and in policy making. I want to help you. I want to be a voice for all of you as somebody who's not in the day to day fray of taking votes, but will always have an office that's open to you. Let's partner together on economic development and on other policies as they come through the legislature. So I think I'll stop there. I want to say one final thing, though, which is that I know there's a lot of concern that. You know, McCleary is the issue of the year and the issue of the decade, really, and that as we struggle with these sources of revenue and we think about these things, well, what's going to happen to cities and is there going to be more pain? And you need to work harder than ever, I think, this coming year to make sure that we don't take another step back. But I also want to say this. Think about my parents in Baltimore deciding to come to Bellevue. The success and the viability of your cities does depend on your school districts being world class. It does depend on having a quality education. That is the magnet for talented workers. It's the magnet for successful, high value businesses. And you know, when you think about the kind of social service needs that your community has, you know, this is a bipartisan point to make that you head, and pre you head those off, you preempt those best when you make investments in public education. And so I know that we think of these as different buckets. And we know that you all have the work that you have to do, and you need state and federal funds to help you do that work. But I, I want you to know that there is a collaborative effort here and that you will see the benefits in the long term for sure, and I think even in the medium term from our investments in having a fairer public school system where your ability to fund your schools is not so singularly dependent on your ability to do new levies uh, at, at for school districts. So I, I wanted to make that point. I'm going to stop talking now. Happy to answer uh, any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Cyrus. I do have a couple of questions. Great. First, if you could expand just a little bit uh, about how, as Lieutenant Governor, you could help uh, reduce the difficult. Oh, uh, I didn't answer any with, of the questions. I'm sorry, I didn't answer any of the questions you gave me. Well, no, you did. I checked uh, most of them off. If okay. you could just expand a little bit on what you could do to lessen the partisan divide that yeah. has caused difficulty in getting things done in the legislature. Well, I want to say so. So, kind of the the easiest like you know, hot take in the world is to like give some spin or, or, or opinion on why things are so partisan and so gridlocked. And, and it's definitely the case that there is, um, you know, some, there is some dysfunction in the legislature. But I guess I wanna, I wanna uh, put a little bit of a, a gloss on it and say, look, we are dealing with some really, really big challenges. And yeah, we've gone into some special sessions and and I'm disappointed mainly when we go into the regular session with a mentality of, oh, well, I'm taking out a six-month gym membership. You know, I, that doesn't help. But let's be clear. What have we done in the last four years? Okay, we've done, we've worked with you all to pass a $16 billion transportation package, the largest one ever in state history and the first one in a decade. We've done a first of its kind nationally, at least in modern political memory, uh, higher ed tuition reduction. We've implemented one of the first two systems of legal marijuana taxation and regulation and a three-tiered system for the first time. We have dealt with, while doing all of that, we have dealt with uh, a, an unprecedented uh, court order and contempt order against the state, not against the legislature, but against the state for the way we fund our public schools and have put several billion dollars more already into our public K-12 system. We have completely reformed and created a world-class early learning system and put more funding into that. And we've been responding to real deficits in our mental health system and put more money into that. There's still more to be done. That's a lot of work. And I did, I'm not saying let's pat ourselves on the back, but I'm just saying, think about it. Most of that's been done in a split legislature. All of that's been done with a split legislature. Uh, in a pretty partisan time. And so, you know, I, I want to say the, the challenges of this state are big. We are a larger state at this point. We are complex economically. Our revenue system is not the most logical. And so the state struggles on the revenue side to do these things. I, 
you know, and so, yeah, there are moments of breakdown, but all in all, I have very good friends on both sides of the aisle, in the House and in the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, and I think that the same can be said for almost every legislator. We are doing our best. The, the issues that come before us are partisan in nature, though, many of them, right? Do you, you close a tax loophole? Can be really, really tough. Um, do you uh, do something about climate change? And what do you do about it? Can be really tough. What do you do about gun violence? I mean, you know these issues are tough because I bet you even when you only have to count to four out of seven on a city council, you know it's tough. So now think about 147 plus a governor. So, you know, I, I want to say, you know, concretely, I'm going to keep doing what I've always done, which is listening to everybody, but I also want to use the office of the lieutenant governor as a place where we can socialize and bring people together in a social way. Um, you know, it was a couple years ago, the uh, Legislative Ethics Board changed the rules on, on meals. You guys may have heard about this and restricted lobbyists taking legislators out for meals. And there's, there's good reasons for doing that. But one of the, and you know, some of the folks here who are um, lobbyists in Olympia can attest to this, that one of the unfortunate things is that we've had fewer get-togethers of a social nature. And oftentimes it's lobbyists who bring Democrats and Republicans together for a meal. And, and when the rest of your day is spent in caucus rooms with your own tribe, those can be some of the only opportunities to get to humanize and socialize and, and build relationships. On the east side, Democrats and Republicans have been getting together once a week um, to, uh, to meet on a bipartisan basis. So I'd like to build on that with the Lieutenant Governor's office and bring some of that back. And you know we won't use lobbyist dollars, so there's not gonna be an issue there, but we should just have people come by, Democrats and Republicans, House members as well, uh, to get to know one another. So I'm looking for, uh, for those kinds of opportunities. I think that can often make a huge difference. And you look back in the day when these deals did get done, um, a lot of it was uh, lubricated by good food and let's just say also occasionally a drink or two, so. Thank you. Next question. Do you have ideas or opinions about what you as Lieutenant Governor could help us and the state do to address the epidemic of homelessness and mental health challenges facing our communities? Yeah, well, um, so the, the, and I think, you know, Mr. McLennan kind of touched on this, that there are, um, there are, there are numerous reasons for people to come um, homeless. We know that um, homelessness is uh, the result of other parts of our public policy that aren't working well. Um, our foster care system, when it fails, um, you have kids aging out and ending up um, uh, homeless. When uh, our criminal justice system doesn't work, when our mental health system doesn't work, when our veterans affairs don't work. And then sometimes there's, um, there's challenges that are unique to a family but that can be really, really um, uh, traumatic like domestic violence um, or um, anti-LGBT sentiment that can uh, drive people to leave home without uh, a, a safety net. And so for the, um, for the immediate issue of those who are homeless, um, I take a rapid rehousing uh, approach and philosophy and I think that many, you know, we need to kind of change some of our, uh, we need to open our minds a little bit to this idea that if you're not sober, you, you can't have a roof over your head because oftentimes the, the, the causal link goes the other way. So we need to have a better understanding of that. that that is difficult work and requires um, real support for the agencies that are, that are able to do that. Um, it is unthinkable to me that we don't have winter shelters available to people um, all over uh, our state. And so, um, but, but getting people into permanent rapid rehousing from a shelter um, is absolutely uh, the right approach. Uh, when it, you know, I, I'm very intrigued by and I've, uh, co-sponsored some legislation to get our state thinking about social impact bonds. I encourage those of you um, who are interested in these issues to look at what the mayor of Salt Lake City has done um, with respect to social impact bonds. That's a, a way in which you, um, uh, you get a, a private investor uh, to front the uh, cost of a certain intervention and then you use the savings to your uh, budget from that intervention if it's successful to pay back that investor, uh, but it allows you to defer the risk onto a private entity. So I'm, I'm, I'm very interested as someone who's gonna work on economic development issues, I think there's a nice synergy there. Um, you know, uh, thinking about some innovative models 
Uh, but, but really, it has to start earlier with uh, funding of our mental health system, uh, funding of our, uh, and, and some changes to our criminal justice system. And then finally, I'll say this. The, we need a much, much better way of discovering who is about to miss a rent payment. Like, who are the people who are right on the edge? And, and I would say, you know, rather than ending up at Money Tree, I want to find out, I want them to end up, if no, nowhere else, at the office of the lieutenant governor. I want us to know who is in that desperate strait where they would feel that they need to go get a payday loan, for example, um, or pawn things. Because that's a, that's a canary in the coal mine that they may become homeless soon. We are really, really bad at figuring out who's about to be homeless. And if we, can, if we can solve it then, it's a lot easier, right, than to actually then get them a home. All right, Cyrus, thank you. We are out of time for any additional questions. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would please join me in thanking Cyrus. Thank you Cyrus guys so much. Thank you.